Hello everyone, welcome back to Alkaline Hydroxide 784 and today we will be covering electromagnetism in the physics series. So, you know, so far we looked at electricity itself, now we are looking at the interaction between electricity and magnetic, like magnets in general, or magnetic fields I suppose. Now, once again I'll go through all all the learning outcomes and let's see how it goes. Right, so the first one is about what exactly a magnetic field is. Of course, like all the other fields that we have seen, I'm not talking about the glass field, but the um, like the gravitational field and all that. Yeah, it's a it's a field of force, and you can't really see it unless you put some iron bearings, like iron dust next to a magnet or something. But otherwise you can't really see the field of force. And this magnetic field is generated by two different things. One is by current carrying conductors, which is what you're going to look at today. And the second is by permanent magnets, which I think you're already familiar with. So you, you know you have the magnet and then you draw the lines out. So that's pretty much... Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. <laughs> Um, so since we do know that current carrying conductors now actually produce a magnetic field, we need to we would like to see what it looks like. Although you can't really see it with, you know, you can visually see it, but you can represent it in a visual manner. So the second learning outcome is to is about seeing what kind of patterns do form from you know these currents. So if a current is traveling in a wire, what happens is, you know the right hand grip rule? There's this, this grip rule um, kind of, you know, involves like the thumb being the direction of the current in the wire. And the hand itself, like your hand curls into your palm, right? So the, the, the direction in which it curls inside is the... The direction of the field. So if you're looking at a, lo at a long straight wire, the field is actually kind of like circular, like all the yeah, the, the magnetic flux. As when you you draw it, you, you represent it by a bunch of circles. And um, yeah, so you just that's how you draw it, like. So if you imagine the wire. So if instead of looking at it from the side, now if you look at it from the top, top or top view or something like that, we have this um, um, way of representing which is, if it's a dot, you imagine it like an arrow going towards you. So the current is actually coming up towards you out of the paper. And if it's um cross, it's imagine it like the arrow going downwards. So it's like the current is going into the paper. So. Accordingly, you can move your hand in that direction and then figure out what direction the the so-called magnetic field is going on, like going in, I suppose. Um, yeah, that's what it looks like. So if so, now that we looked at it in a wire, what happens when you make the wire into a coil, like this one single coil, a flat circular? I mean, the one that they're referring to here is just like this bent wire kind of like just one single wire that goes um, out and then into the paper again so in that scenario you just look at the individual sections where the wire is going out and where it's going in so the current direction kind of depends where it's going out and where it's going in so you just take note where it, which side is going out and which side is going in and accordingly use your right hand grip rule again and, can, and then in the center of those two, um, you know, if you imagine the bent wire in between the two points where it contacts the so-called paper or plane or whatever you want to call it, the, the magnetic fields kind of intersect in a way. So you can imagine it as, you know, like how in chemistry you have your S orbitals, then when they intersect, they kind of just become this, they just add up onto each other like this combine into one single single thing. So likewise this thing will like the magnetic fields also kind of cancel or add on to each other 
and it kind of produces this a particular shape which I will have drawn by now, hopefully. And the final one is a long solenoid and that one would be a wire which is actually coiled into like, you know, somewhat like the spring in your pen. Unless you all are using pens that don't require springs or something, but yeah, like the spring that can have a shape. And since it's coiled, if you imagine it as like one section of the coil, right? If you imagine when the current goes in, you can use a right hand grip to to actually see the you know the field. But the easier thing to I mean yeah, you can see the field through that. And the and since if you think about it, the field is like circular for each section of that wire, right? So when all of these fields come together, like the center kind of has one straight field, like one straight field line drawn. Like when you draw it, that's what you draw. You draw one line in the center, and then um, the rest of the line will kind of curve out, out outwards at the edges of the solenoid, and that's kind of what it looks like. That's how they combine together. Uh, yeah. So if you want to actually know what kind of magnet the solenoid is, you can use the right hand again. But in this scenario, you use your the curving part of your hand matching, like you match that to the direction of the current. And the thumb will then point towards the north, north pole of the solenoid. <laughs> Kind of. So that's another way to use the right hand grip rule. Okay, so now moving on, we you know you have like three different equations inside your data list, or whatever the thing that you're given in the exam. And the reason is because you're not expected to memorize this like these equations. So what you use them to to find the flux density the magnetic flux density of the field. So in other words, the strength of the magnetic field, which is represented by the B. So in, so you have the B equals to uh, mu naught I or two pi D, and B equals to mu naught N I or two R, and B equals to mu naught N I for the three different cases, the wire, coil, and solenoid. So hopefully that would work. So yeah, so the, the next learning outcome is okay, so yeah, for the for the equations you just need to read it off the data booklet, transfer it properly to the question and just answer like put in all the values and answers. It shouldn't be too hard to do it. That's pretty much it, yeah, so for D, the the next learning outcome, which is to show. Ah, uh, so the magnetic field due to the solenoid may be influenced by the presence of a ferrous core. Right. So in a solenoid, it it does have a magnetic field on its own, but the field can it's not that it's not like very. Um. I guess the, fer the, the ferrous core, in other words, the iron that you put in the center of the solenoid, like an iron rod or something, it helps to concentrate the magnetic field even more because of the fact that like, iron has its own magnetic properties. You know, the, the fact that iron can can have the all of the atoms pointing in one direction kind of thing. The electron spin kind of I'm not, not sure if it's electron, the atom spin, the ion spin can be in one direction, I guess. Yeah, so it helps to to make the magnetic field of the solenoid much more present and much more easier to, um, you know, see, like, to measure in a sense. So the next learning outcome is about, oh, okay, it's... It literally just says show an understanding that a current carrying conductor placed in a magnetic field might experience a force. Wow, brilliant. Okay, I'm at. So if you know that a current carrying conductor can make a magnetic field, then 
and a magnetic field can also affect the current carrying conductor because the current carrying conductor is a magnet too in a way so technically it makes sense it will experience a force so what exactly is that force how do you calculate it well for that we have our wonderful equation force equals to b i l sine theta okay um so b is the magnetic flux of the magnetic field i is the current of the conductor l is the length or yeah kind of and sine theta is the angle at which the angle between the field and the current in the sense uh, the angle between the field and the current because if you think about it the force the force magnetic field and current it kind of works in a um, vectory way so it works best at 90 degree angles and if you think about it, sine theta is maximum at 90 degrees. So but if it's not 90 degrees, you won't get the full effect of the force. The force won't be maximum. And therefore, that's why, that's why you need the sine theta there. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. But if you're looking at the exact direction of each of them, um, as because you know it's vector, it's it kind of like the y, x, y, z axis kind of thing. But if you want to make your life easier, you can use something called Fleming's left hand rule, which is um, just take your left hand, you know, keep stick your thumb and the first two fingers out. I think you know what I'm talking about. You can just search it online if you are still confused. And the top, the, yeah, the thumb is actually the force, the, the force. I don't remember what each finger is called. Okay, but your your ring finger is the current, and the one in middle, the one that's in between the two of them is the field. <laughs> I think I can draw this better than explaining it verbally, but you get the point. So the reason why this makes sense is because if you look at vectors, you have this uh, equation where two vectors can be multiplied and you get the cross product of the vector, which is the, the, the cross product is the thing that sticks out perpendicular to those two vectors. So in this case, it's like, it's like doing a cross product of magnetic field and current and you get force. And there's a reason why the sine theta is up here, kind of. So yeah, the next one is define magnetic flux density. Okay, actually I do not remember the definition for magnetic flux density like in full, but um, yeah. <laughs> But magnetic flux density is what we're referring to with B, kind of. So B is uh, okay. Well, B is obviously dependent on the current in this in a current carrying conductor, but actually I don't remember. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, I remember now. So, in normal density, you have the pressure. Wait, no. Normal density, you have the mass per volume, right? So, in magnetic flux density, we are, we are not looking at mass and volume here, but we're going to look at the amount of flux there is per area. So, it's like um, it's like an average value, like, right? It's, it's like a density but for magnetic flux so it's um so if you want to define it you must write down the specific value of areas 
So you use those SI units and then define it. Like. So magnetic flux density is is defined such that actually you don't really need to say one Newton. Uh, uh, wait, we're not on Newton, sorry. <laughs> it's defined as the average it's the, defined as the magnetic flux over the area that the magnetic flux kind of covers, I suppose. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, so... So the next learning outcome is how the force can be used to measure the flux density. Okay, so you have the current carrying conductor and it... Um, experiences a force because it's in a magnetic field as we just saw and using that force sorry okay using you can kind of measure the force somehow and now you need to know what what the b is because you do not know what the b is and you're trying to figure out the core the force and the current balance uh well, you have a you can you can pass a certain amount of current through the through the conductor, and then see how much force there is, in a way. So by doing that, you can like you know, um, like if you think about it, if you if you don't think about the L sine theta part. The F equals to BI, like let's make sure sine theta is 90 or it's a constant all the time. The angle is constant and the L is also constant. So F equals to B times I times the constant, right? So as long as you have the... Since B is also constant here, you can technically think of it like a gradient. So if you plot F versus I, you can then get B times the L sine theta part and you can then find what B is from there. That's how the current balance thing works. You can just keep changing the current and measure the force and then plot it and then you get the flux density. Okay, so the next one is the force between current carrying conductors and predict the direction of the forces. Okay, um you know that the current carrying conductor experiences a force in a magnetic field. And you do know that they also produce a magnetic field. So if you put two of them near each other, they will obviously exert a force on each other. And uh, if let's say if you have two, I think that's the example they will use. They will use two straight wires going up and the current can either go in the same direction or in different directions. If it is in the same direction, um, let's, the, the short answer is in the same direction it attracts, in different direction it repels. But if you don't understand why this makes sense, because they used the idea that north and south attract but not and not repel, right? Like, why is it the opposite with the current direction in a sense? Because if you actually look at the magnetic field that they produce, if they're in the same, if the currents are going in the same direction, and um, you'd imagine two, like if you draw circles on each of them, the circles are all, the field is going in the same direction. So when you add them in a, you know, in a vector way, like in the center of it, the field is adding on, it's going in the same direction. So it kind of wants to attract, kind of. Yeah, but you know, no, it's not in the same direction, it's in the opposite direction. <laughs> so like the one on the right, it will have, um, let's say the current is going up. So the magnetic field will be pointing out of paper at that point. And the other, the wire on the left will have the magnetic field going into the paper. And therefore they attract each other. So you shouldn't look at the current itself, but you should look at the fact that the magnetic fields are opposite and therefore they attract each other. It's like not in South Pole. But if you're looking at two different directions of currents, one of the magnetic fields is now reversed 
and in the center they're both going in the same direction like the magnetic field so it repels um yeah so the next learning outcome is predict the direction of the force oh yeah so yeah it's okay direction of the force on a charge moving in a magnetic field so we finished looking at current carrying conductors and now we're moving on to the charge itself moving like in a current carrying conductor we imagine like the like the electrons are moving within this certain medium but if you now you're looking at actual charged particles moving in a certain direction without like a wire or something but they are still technically they still technically work like the current carrying conductor because it is a charge that is moving so it is a current of its own in a way um, so when the charge moves in the magnetic field we you can think of the direction of the charge as the current in a way so if if the like the conventional current is actually opposite to that of the the movement of negative stuff i guess <laughs> so um sorry my nose is like stuffy <laughs> yeah so so when the electron is moving you use the opposite as the current like the direction that is moving use the opposite direction as current and then you can just use your left hand rule again kind of to get the direction of the force okay so the next one would be recall and solve problems using the equation f equals to bqv sine theta okay so earlier we saw f equals to bil sine theta but i'm gonna just tell you that this is technically somewhat equivalent to that it's just the difference is the il and the qv in the in the conductor you can afford to put il because the conductor has a length and it has a current but when you're looking at a charge, you don't really know what the current is unless you factor in the how fast it moves. And the V actually account for the for the fastness bit and the length as well. So QV is kind of similar to IL. And this equation definitely works. So you can definitely do that. Yeah, so just just so once again, um, the angle would be between the direction of the so-called current created by this charge, um, and the like, angle between that and the field. Actually, the direction here shouldn't matter because this is the angle will still be like the sine theta will still be the same no matter which angle you take from that particular thing. The only, the only like in terms of magnitude, it will be the same. Um, as for positive negative, it kind of depends on where you take the angle as well. So, just take note of that, lah. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so the next learning outcome is how charged particles are deflected by uniform electric and uniform magnetic fields. Okay, so we saw in the chemistry series, there's something like this too. And um, in that, like, this is the easier, this is the more appropriate place to look and understand how this works, because it's physics. So if you look at the electric field, you can have your two parallel plates of plus and minus. So Logically speaking, like how knots and sound attract each other, plus positive and negative will attract each other. So if your charged particle is positive, it'll go towards a negative. And if it's positive, it'll go towards wait, what? Yeah, if your charged particle is positive, it goes towards negative. If it's negative, it'll go towards a positive. Yeah. Great. And if it's neutral, it won't go anywhere, <laughs> I suppose. And um now we see how they move in a magnetic field. 
So if the, the typical way to represent this is that they will show the magnetic field going in or out of the paper and then you send like this charged particle uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field. So what happens is that charged particle goes in a circular motion. I am not kidding you. Your notes are not kidding you. It, def it goes in a circular motion. The reason for this is when you take your left hand and you look at the, the directions in a sense, like the charged particle itself, you can imagine it like a current, right? So, so at the, initially the, the current is pointing, you know, in this direction and then the, the magnetic field is pointing either up or down and the force will then be per, is perpendicular to these two at all points. So since the force, the force is perpendicular to these two, if the magnetic field is large enough for it, like if the, it spreads over a lot, large enough area, then the charged particle will eventually um, assume a circular motion because it, the force on it is somewhat like that in a circular motion, like the, the, the centripetal force in a sense. And therefore, it goes in a circular motion as long as you don't do anything else to it. But um, it is possible to make it not just go in a centripetal, like a circular motion, but in all, forward at the same time. So how do you do that? Uh, you don't send it in at 90 degrees, you send it in at an angle to the magnetic field. So when you do that, it has an element of it at this perpendicular like the element of the direction, like the direction of the current that's perpendicular to the field, and that will still give a circular motion, but the direction that the, the um, wait, what element? I mean, when you do your vectors, you have the horizontal and the vertical part to it, right? So the one that's not perpendicular to the field will then cause the, you know, this um, charged particle to move forward because it, is not influenced by the field in the sense. So the sum of those two movements is a helical movement with a constant radius kind of. And that is pretty cool to look at in a diagram I guess. <laughs> so the next one is, oh it's actually the last learning outcome. So this is which is really interesting. I actually quite enjoy like the logic of it. And you can use both the electric and magnetic field to do velocity selection. So how this works is you have a bunch of charged particles. And since their masses aren't very helpful for exerting a, a, a big enough force to oppose whatever electric or magnetic force it, you know, is exerted on it, we use the two, those two forces instead, like the electric force and the magnetic force. So if you set up the electric field and the magnetic field such that the electric force is parallel and directly opposite to the magnetic force, then the particles will experience different forces based on their velocity. So if when you're sending the particles, you want a certain velocity to to be captured sometimes. And um, if you want them to go directly and, and you know, reach that place where you want to capture them, you'd want these two forces to be balanced. So at a particular velocity, the, the, the electric force and the magnetic force will be balanced and the particle will not be deflected upwards or downwards if you're looking at it in terms of a vertical electric field and will then be collected in the collector. But why would you want a particle that has a constant velocity, a certain velocity? Well, uh, in this scenario, we're not really trying to select for the velocity per se, but the, the kinetic energy of the particle. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, you'd want to find particles with this certain amount of kinetic energy. And if you know their mass and everything, you can also figure out their velocity in a sense. So that's how it can be used 
to select certain particles of a certain velocity. And um, well, actually this can be used in chemistry as well. So you can isolate certain particles to analyze their energies and things like that. And then from and the wavelength of the energy, I suppose. And from there you can figure out what's inside a certain compound or something like that. So that's pretty cool. And I quite like that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I hope you found this video useful. And I hope I didn't sound too, I don't know, weird or something. <laughs> um, and if you found this useful, please press the like button and subscribe. And with that, I would like to say thank you and bye.